OK, so we're in a new season of this class. And, and we're ready to kind of jump into really the theory proper. We have a fully developed model, which we really need. And I was thinking about how to proceed. What I, the next thing to talk about for sure is the idea of computable enumerability, recursive enumerability. And I started writing out notes for that. And I was like, wait, well, I should probably explain what enumerability means in the first place. And then I started to explain that in other notes. And I was like, well, I should probably back up and teach some basic set theory. And I think at this point, I've decided for myself that uh, you know, the only the only responsible thing to do is to really actually suck it up and and go through the set theory of like kind of from the beginning. So a lot of what I'm going to say is done in much more detail in the notes that are linked in the description, uh, and then some. But we'll eventually get to some stuff that isn't, particularly stuff about products of sets. Um, so a set is intuitively uh, an unordered collection of things, uh, and the things are called elements. And what I mean by, intu by intuitively here is, I mean, this is what a set is. Um, but, but what I want to emphasize is that set theory is really the foundation for all mathematics. When I, you know, I mentioned on the, in the first lecture that uh, you know, what the process of math is that you start with a set of axioms, and then you, and then you have a model which satisfies those axioms. Well, here's, here's, a, here's a maybe a piece of news that you don't know already. Everything in mathematics is, at its core, a set. And we have. Uh, we have a vocabulary of set theory, and we have, a, we have axioms for set theory. We have um, a set of axioms called uh, ZFC, uh, which, which basically specify what objects are, un, what, they, what, what is and isn't a set. And then whenever anyone proves anything in math, uh, the assumption is that we're proving that thing within the standard model, whatever the standard model is, and we'll talk about what I even mean by that later, of, of ZFC set theory. So the point with all of this is that set theory can and should be done uh, with a higher level of rigor than what I'm going to do here. Um, I'm going to cover what we need to know in order to just talk about sets. Um, but, but we will gradually refine what I'm saying over time, depending on how, how far we get. Um, but right now, this is, our, this is a perfectly fine definition of a set. Um, and so we use, set, we use brackets for a set. So we use capital letters to denote sets. And we use brackets, or these things, to indicate what's in a set. And I know a lot of this stuff is stuff I've been doing without saying uh, maybe clearly enough in previous videos. But the reason I didn't feel like we needed to uh, talk about this stuff explicitly then is because I was just building machines at that point. I didn't really need to talk explicitly about the, the, the math, I guess, almost, so to speak. Um, but now we kind of will, so I need to go over it. So th th these denote sets. And so if I have like A, B, C, D, E, this is the set. This is the set. Containing these five these five elements, and notation is that like if B B is an element of A, B is one of the one of the things in the bag of things called A. So I'm going to write this is what this means. Reads uh, B is in A. Another way to read it is is to say B is an element of A or B is a member of A. Those are all different ways to say that B is just one of the things in this set. Um, so what do I mean by unordered here? Well, the big difference uh, is, is it comes in our definition of equality. So con contrast this with ordered tuples, so five tuples or quadruples or whatever. You know, if I, you know, here's the quintuple, quintuple, uh, that that is kind of similar. If I put parentheses here, a, b, c, d, e, this is this is an ordered five tuple or ordered quintuple. And, and the difference between these things is equality. Difference, oops. Between these objects uh, lies in equality. Lies in how you define equality. So basically, the idea is that A is not ordered. So I can rearrange these however I want. I still have the same set. So for example, it's going to be the case that C, E, D, A, B, this is the same as the set A, B, C, D, E. They're the same because in the sense of sets, all I care about is what objects are in them. I don't care about what order they are. However, this, this ordered quintuple, A, B, C, D, E, this is not the same as um, 
uh, C, E, D, A, B. So they're the same if I put curly brackets, but they're not the same if I put parentheses. Because, and so that, that's the difference. The, these things have additional structure in the sense that they're ordered. Ordered, ordered pairs, ordered tuples are, are, are ordered, and then sets are unordered. So that's the difference. With sets, we're, we're talking about very primitive things. We're just talking about bags of things that can be in any order. Now the next thing to talk about is definitely set builder notation, which is another thing that I've said a lot, I've, I've done a lot with, but haven't really said it explicitly. Uh, set builder notation is a way to define sets quickly without thinking too hard about it. So the idea, the notation is that you, I say a is equal to the set of all x such that some some property regarding x. This is the set build notation. So I say it's I, I, the, basically the way this reads is um, a is the set of all x such that uh, thing is true for x. That's how that's the way this reads, and and the really the key word here is such that. The such that is these is right here. It's it's the it's the colon here. So that's that's set build notation. Just to maybe do an example real quick. I can say, you know, uh, a equals the set of all x that are real numbers. So sometimes you want to specify the set right here, um, such that x squared equals two. So I can always just do that. I can define this set. And really, you know, this is a dumb way to say that, um, you know, obviously this is just the set negative 1, 1. Wait, no, 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 no. Uh, plus or minus the square root of 2. I can do math. You know, obviously this is just plus or minus the set, through, set square root of 2, but I can, I can just define it this way by just specifying some property. And a lot of the time, that's nice to do because you don't necessarily know everything about what the set is. You don't want to just list out all the elements. You just want to say something about it. So that's the way to do this. So this reads, um, so just to use my mouse, this, this just basically reads A is the set of all real numbers x, so x and r, such that when I square it, I get 2. That's what this is. So that, that's a convenient way to define sets. So the next thing to define is subset. Define A to be a subset of B. So this reads. A is a subset of B uh, if for all x in A, x is also in B. So in other words, x in A implies x in B. And I also, you know, this word, this, this symbol here reads implies. I'm just trying to basically, we're about to get more mathy with kind of what we're about to do. And I want to make sure that I'm being explicit about some of the things that I've just kind of said out loud, but haven't been explicit about yet. So this reads implies. Um, so that's what subset means. So and then of course, you know, you can draw, you can start to draw Venn diagrams. Like so here's my set A, it's got some stuff in it. And then if A is a subset of B, then of course, what that kind of looks like everything in A is also in B. So I have like this. Here's some other stuff, and then here's the set B. All right, this is what it looks like to be a subset. Um, also, uh, define A to equal B if, uh, ev basically, there's a lot of ways to define equality. I can basically say, um, I'll say it like this, everything in A is in B, and vice versa. So maybe the more formal way to say this is that A is equal to B if X in A implies X in B, and uh, X in B implies X in A, which you can shorthand this. This, this whole thing combines you can just kind of use x and a if you put arrows on either side. And this means that this, that's what this says. Um, uh, 
and x is in d. And this, this guy right here, this means, uh, this can read a lot of ways. You can say, um, this is logical equivalence. Now, I'm sort of doing things out of order even here. I should probably start with logic and then get to set theory after that. And we are going to get to have to deal with logic uh, explicitly the way we're dealing with set theory here eventually. Uh, but I'm going to kick that can, can down the road and just say that for now, this is logical equivalence. And the way that you read this is you can read it as the word, you can read it as if and only if, if you want. You can also read it as is necessary and sufficient for. So you could read this as x is an a, if and only if x is in b. You can also read this as x is an a, uh, is, is necessary and sufficient for x to b and b. Uh, you can say this in a bunch of ways. Or you could say x is an a is logically equivalent to x is in b. But basically, that's what that means. And if you, if you look at this, and then you look at this, then you really say, you see another definition of what it means for a to equal b, which is that a equals b if a is a subset of b and b is a subset of a, which is often the way that you prove that two sets are equal. You prove, that, you prove, a set, you prove two sets are equal in kind of two steps. First, you say, you, you look at a set, something in A, and you prove that it's in B. And then you look at something in B and prove that it's in A, and you prove that they're the same set. So that's uh, equality and subset. I'm running through this really fast, but again, my set theory notes are in the description. And you should read those if you haven't. Um, so I'll slow down as we get to stuff that's less like prevalent in those notes. Um, we have an empty set. which you denote with like a, a zero with like a line through it. Uh, I tried it out one more time. There we go. That's good. So this is the empty set. And it exists. And if you remember, it's the set which has nothing. Uh, the set containing no elements. Uh, and you know, so really formally, I can basically write that it's just empty bra curly brackets, but with nothing here. Uh, this exists, this empty set can be proven to exist uh, by the axioms of set theory. So remember the, those axioms that I, that I called ZFC before. In, in really, really super formal mathematics, there are axioms for ZFC set theory, and you can prove that any model of ZFC set theory has to have an empty set. There are always a, you can prove that the empty set exists. Um, obviously, who cares about doing that right now, but, but you can do that. Um, one thing that you, we should note about the empty set is that the empty set for all sets A, the empty set is a subset of A. So the empty set is a subset of every set. Uh, why? Let's, let's think about why. This is actually something you can prove um, by, by what we said already. It's a really quick proof. so. Proof. Suppose it isn't. You know, then there exists some set A or some set B, let's say, such that uh, the empty set is not a subset of it. Um, what does it mean to not be a subset, though? It means that it's not the case. It is not the case that um, every element of the empty set is also in B. So if, if you have, so we're assuming, so we're proving that, that the, let, let me just summarize so far. We're proving that the empty set is a subset of every set. And we're proving it by contradiction. Again, we're going to get more into the logic stuff in a bit. But hopefully, hopefully it makes sense what it means by prove something by contradiction. I prove something by contradiction by assuming the thing is false and arriving at a paradox, essentially. So we're going to assume, assume that it's not. And then we're going to arrive at a paradox. So we're supposing that the empty set is not a subset of every set. And if it isn't, then there's some set B, obviously, that the empty set is not a subset of. And for that to be the case, we just kind of have to now look at the definition of subset. It's not the case that every element of the empty set is also in B. Thus, there must exist something in the empty set uh, which uh, is not in B. But this is a contradiction. This is a paradox, because I said the empty set was empty. Now, the empty set 
is no longer empty. I just said that there's an element x that has to be uh, in 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 b or sorry in the empty set, but that's not in b. But now I've said there's something in the empty set, so it's no longer the empty set. So to suppose that so, to, so the empty set has to be a subset of every set because to assume that it's not uh, is to assume that uh, that the empty set is not empty. <laughs> so that's why. Um, just a little example of a proof by contradiction. Super unnecessary, but whatever. Now, there's always some model. Uh, there's always some, let me say, there's always some universe of discourse uh, being discussed when we're talking about sets. That is to say, like everything, everything is in some set somewhere. I'm always, if I'm talking about calculus, I'm talking about the real numbers, and they're implicitly a set of the, the uh, an element of the set of all real numbers. I'm implicitly talking about that set. So there's always some master set, uh, which I'll call the universe, or the universe of discourse, if you want to sound really, uh, really uh, uppity. So the bottom line is that there is always some universe of discourse. I'll call it U, for the purpose of this like introduction. And so when I'm talking about sets, I'm always kind of talking about sets that are subsets of this big master set U, or elements of, of this master set U. Um, and it's context sensitive. It depends on what you're talking about. But uh, that is the case. So. Uh, Let's, let's now talk about unions, intersections, and complements. So unions. Uh, a union B. That's, what, that's how this reads. A union, a union B um, is equal to, I'm going to define this with set builder notation. It's the, set, it's the collection of all x such that x is in A or x is in B. The key word here is or. So you know it's basically the collection of all things that are in either A or B. So it's just the reason that it's a, that it's a, 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 a U here, you should, you should see this as like a cup. And the way I see it is like you're taking everything in A and everything in B and just dumping it in this cup that has everything. And that, 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 new, that new set you have is A union B. So it's the set of everything which is in both, just dumping them all into one common set. So that's what the union is. Um, and of course, you know, maybe I should start drawing some Venn diagrams. You know, here's A, here's B. And so the A union B is just everything. So you just kind of shaded region is A union B. OK. Uh, intersections. A intersection B is equal to the set of all x such that x is in A and x is in B. So uh, it's the stuff that's shared in common between A and B. OK. What else? Uh, Complements. So I mean, okay, I'll just draw it. You know, here's A, here's B. The shaded region, the intersection of A and B, is this region in the middle. Uh, 
And then finally, complements. This, these are binary operations. They're, they're things that you do between two sets. Uh, the complement is something you do to one set. So complements. Um, Uh, it, basically, there's a lot of ways to say you can write it a complement. You could also write it a bar, two different notations. They're both they're both valid notations, and I do use both. I'll I'll see use a complement right now. So I'll say sometimes a bar is equal to the set of all uh, x such that x is not in a. And really, you know, in all three of these cases, x is in u. x is in the universe. So it's kind of weird to say the set of all things not in A, because then the question kind of becomes like, well, where am I? What are you talking? What exactly? Because, I mean, there's a lot of things not in A. And this is kind of dependent on what you're talking about. So sometimes people try to define this differently and make it more rigorous. I don't really care that much. And I wish this would stop being highlighted. OK. So uh, that's unions, intersections, and complements. I know I'm going through this stuff very fast, but there it's, it's covered in more details in my notes in the uh, description. So, oh wait, I should probably draw the Venn diagram. Now, you can't really draw a complement like I did here unless you draw the universe. And so typically, you'll draw the universe by making like a big box around everything and call this U. Same with this. So the, the box, the kind of thing that surrounds everything is U. And now, with a box, I can kind of draw A. So here's the box, and then here's A. And then here's A's complement. As everything else. So this is A's complement. OK. Um, also, set differences, I guess. Um, differences are a little lesser because you can define them in terms of the things we defined already. I can say A minus B equals the set of all x uh, such that x is in A and x is not in B. And by the way, you know, if you put a if you put a line through anything uh, in math, you mean not not the it's not the case that x is in B. And so, you know, it's exactly what it sounds like. You know, so to draw it, I guess um, here's A, here's B, and so it's the set of all stuff in A that's just in A. So we ignore the shaded region. This is A minus B. Um, and, and the reason that differences are sort of lesser than these three is that these three are sort of everything you need. In fact, you don't even really need uh, bo all three of these. You can, you can get by with just complements and unions and define intersections in terms of that um, using De Morgan's laws. But I'll, I'm, I'm not really motivated to talk about De Morgan's laws right now. But I can define this pretty easily. Note that A minus B is just equal to A intersection with B's complement. If I take A and intersect it with everything that's not in B, I get, uh, I get A minus B just as well as if I defined it this way. So, so I can define differences in terms of those things. Um, uh, we say that two sets A and B are disjoint if their intersection is empty. That is, they have nothing in common. So again, just try to draw a picture of this. To have two disjoint sets is to have a set A over here and a set B over here, and there's just nothing in between. Now, what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to actually take this video and I'm going to put it in the beginning of, of my lecture series. I'm going to put it before anything else um, so that people don't get lost. And so in terms of what I was using in that uh, the videos that I've been making, uh, there's still a couple more things that I need to define, uh, notably uh, Cardinality, which I'm going to do in more detail later. So, um, for I'll just say for finite sets, uh, the cardinality, or more commonly the size, 
of a is uh, a bar with bars around it equals the number of elements of a. Um, that's, that's the number of elements in a. Uh, so if a has five things in it, then the cardinality of a is five. And then there's two more things I need to say. One is that, uh, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, so the last two things, power set. Now this guy is another thing. Cardinality and power set are two things that I want to talk about in more detail uh, related directly to um, our, our, our kind of trek towards computable enumerabilities. But, but in any case, the power set of A, so for a set A, P of A, the node of the power set of A, this is the power set of A, is equal to the set of all subsets of A. So power set of A is equal to, in set builder notation, the collection of all B such that B is a subset of A. So that's a little weird to look at at first. Let me just do a quick example. So example, if A is equal to A, B, C, then the power set of A is equal to a bunch of things. It's equal to a bunch of sets. So first of all, we've got the empty set. That's an A. That's a subset of every set, so that's there. Um, it's also got the set, the, it's the singleton sets, the set just containing A, the set just containing B, the set just containing C. It's also got the set A comma B. It's also got the set A comma C. It's also got the set uh, A, uh, it's also got the set B, C, And then finally, it's got the set A, B, C. Note, A is always a subset of A. Every, every set is always a subset of itself. So A, B, C is a subset of A. Um, and so that, that's what the power set is. It's just the set of all subsets. Um, note, the, the, uh, the cardinality of A is equal to 3. And the cardinality of the power set of A is equal to 8, which is, two, incidentally, it's 2 to the third. Why is that? Well, let, we're, well I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to wait on explaining why that's the case until uh, after, after the Turing machine stuff. So that'll be saved for the, for the next video. But next video for me, if you're watching this uh, prior to my Turing machine stuff, then uh, it'll, be, it'll be way later that I justified that. But... In any case, that's the power set. And then the last thing I use throughout these videos without, justif without explaining what it is, 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 the, is products. So finally, and, and this is probably like, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if you've been following my videos up till now, the, the power set and, the, and products are probably the two things that you're not familiar with, um, products. I'll write this as a definition. For two sets. A and B define the Cartesian product, or just the product, uh, of A and B to B, I'm going to denote it A times B, A cross B. That's how I read this, A cross B. And in set builder notation, what this is, is it's the set of all x. It's the set of all it's the set of all ordered pairs a, b, such that a is from a, and b is from b. It's the set of all ordered pairs of elements from one from where the guy on the left is the ordered pair is the thing in the first entry, and the or, on the on the right is the thing in the second entry. So just an, you know, just as another quick example of what I mean by Cartesian product. Um, if A equals A, B, C, and B is equal to 1, 2, 3, uh, then A cross B is equal to this. It's got A1, A2, A3, uh, B1, B2, B3, 
C1, C2, and C3. So is that everything? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Yeah, that's everything. How do I know that it's everything because it's 9? Well, because if you, don't, if you look at it, you'll notice that the cardinality of A cross B is actually the cardinality of A times the cardinality of B. So note A cross B in cardinality, the size of it is equal to the cardinality of A times the cardinality of B. And that, that's always the case for finite sets. And in fact, it's actually always the case for infinite sets, too, in a certain sense. Um, that we'll get into later. And, and just, you know, maybe one more example. You're probably familiar with uh, R2, right? The real numbers, you, you see this a lot in your basic math classes. Um, this is the set of all ordered pairs x, y, such that x and y are both in R. But of course, now you can see that really this R2 is exactly what it looks like. It's R cross R. That's really what this is. This R2 is really shorthand for this. So now you know exactly what, what, what we mean by this. I can, I can just as easily talk about A squared as equaling to a, a, a cross A, or any, any, anything squared or to the N. So that's, this is what that actually means and why, it, why it's referred to. So yeah, that's the basic rundown of just all the basic concepts of that theory. Again, all of this stuff, except for the stuff on Cartesian products, uh, can be found in my notes, which are linked in every video. So uh, hopefully that helped. Thanks for watching.